Thank you, Daniel. And I tell you, right bracket, your brother. It is a real privilege uh, knowing Jessica and Daniel, and in fact, your deacons, Caleb and Haley, and all of you. Um, you might think I'm being trivial, but it's not. Your friendship and your fellowship really does mean something to Joe and I and the believers at Focus Bible Church in Taranga. I want to do a bit of a plug before we open God's Word. So while I'm doing the plug, you might line to search in your Bibles for the book of Hosea. It's in the Old Testament. No shame if you have to look up the contents page. And we're going to do a reading there. Now, every Tuesday, I write a little email blog called The Pastor's Pen. And basically, this is the format. You get 600 words of biblical encouragement. End of story. That's it different subject. Sometimes I do a theme that will run for a few weeks. Most weeks it's a different theme as God has been leading me in my meditation of his word each week and I simply allow that to spill over into a blog. So if you would like to receive that, just give me on a bit of paper um, your name and email address and I'll add you to the automatic mailing system. goes out always on a Tuesday and I usually take a break over Christmas or when I'm in Australia. So um, there you have it. The subject, the theme before us this morning is God is, you ready Stuart, incomparably knowable. I picked that up from your kid's story. Thank you very much. He doesn't realise he's a great introduction to my messages, you know. <laughs> you might have to come home with me, mate. <laughs> God is incomparably knowable. Because why? The theme we're looking at this weekend is not that content with the God who is. How can you be content with a God who really doesn't care if you know him or not? But as we're going to learn, the fact of the matter is God wants to be known by each and every one of us. And so I'm going to read... From Hosea chapter 6, chapter 6 and the first six verses and then we'll use that as a launching pad. The prophet Hosea writes, Come, let us return to the Lord, for he has torn us that he may heal us. He has struck us down that he may bind us up. After two days... He will revive us. On the third day, he will raise us up that we may live before him. Let us know. Let us press on to know the Lord. His going out is sure as the dawn. He will come to us as the showers, as the spring rains that water the earth. What shall I do with you, O Ephraim? What shall I do with you, O Judah? Your love is like a morning cloud, like the dew that goes early away. Therefore, I have hewn you them. Sorry, therefore I have hewn them by the prophets. I have slain them by the words of my mouth, and my judgment goes forth as the light. For I desire steadfast love, and not sacrifice, the knowledge of God, rather than burnt offerings. I want to just make a few comments here before I actually refer to my notes. One of the questions I get asked as a pastor from time to time is this. What's been the most effective thing in your life that has brought you close to Jesus Christ? And here it is. Pain. Pain. And yet, don't we resist pain? We detest pain. What have we just read? God says here in verse 1, He has torn us. Why? Because He wants to heal us. He has struck us down so that He can bind us up. 
My friend, if you do not know God, if you do not have a personal relationship with God, realize that each and every single pain in your life is the direct will of God for the single purpose that he is calling you, he is screaming at you to come and be restored to a right relationship with him through Jesus Christ. No pain should ever be wasted in this life. No pain will ever be wasted as long as we use the pain as the launch pad, as the stepping stone to a right, restored relationship with him. You know, if I was to close in prayer now, that would be sufficient. The word of God is spoken. Today, call out to him. Be restored. Thank God for the pain in your life that triggers you to be surrendered to him as Lord of your life. Well, as I said, our subject before us this morning is God is incomparably knowable. And when I say God is incomparably knowable, I mean he is so unique that none can compare with him. And just as he is incomparable, so he is equally desires to be known intimately, intimately by mankind. The world falsely lies to us and says, we don't think there's a God, but even if there was a God of your imagination, he's somewhere way up there, so distant, so disconnected, that he's just a myth, he's not knowable, and you might as well just give up and live for your own pleasure. And what have we just read? This God that the world claims is at a distance is so compassionate, so loving, so wanting you that he injects and spills just enough suffering in our lives to captivate our attention that we need him and that that need we would choose to turn into belief and want to know him. And if that's not enough, he then gives us a measure of faith by his Holy Spirit so that we have the inner resources to say, yes, God, thank you for the pain. I receive your love. I believe in you. I receive you as my master, as my Lord, and my forgiver of my sin, as my savior. I believe. Now, that's a loving God. That's an intimate God. That's a God who cares for you as an individual, a God who desperately wants you to wake up and give you, him your life's affections and attention. Why? Because he is worthy. Psalm 139 tells us that he knitted your DNA together inside your mother's womb when you were completely ignorant of what was going on. He was stitching your DNA together for the single-minded purpose that in this life you would respond to his love to his inflicted pain of discipline possibly, or just simply pain to get your attention, so that you would believe with the faith that he's given you the capacity to believe with and receive him as your Lord and Saviour, and therefore enter into an eternal life relationship with him that is unbreakable. <laughs> Praise God. It doesn't get any better than that, beloved. That is the gospel of Jesus Christ from eternity to eternity. And he planned this, he predetermined it before he even created the world. And Adam and Eve, you were on his mind. You were in the center of his affections before he created the first molecule in the planet so that you would respond and come to faith in his son, Jesus Christ. That's how much he wants you to know him. I would suggest if that doesn't impress you, you are beyond being impressed. Because that's the extent of God's love. That's a big God with a big heart. I digress from my notes. You know, the Lord revealed to... Uh, <laughs> I apologise. You know, people in FBC are used to my digressions. <laughs> they have to forgive me most weeks. The Lord revealed to Jeremiah the greatest treasure possible for a person to possess. And to some degree, it's a treasure of perspective. To treasure what God says we should treasure. You see, we think we are entitled to demand of the world and from God the things we treasure. The car, the house, the job, whatever it may be that you think you treasure. 
But perspective allows us to see through the word of God what God treasures. And here, Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 24. Let him who boasts, in other words, let him who skites, let him who boasts, boast in this, that he understands and knows me, the Lord. Is that your testimony this morning? That if you had the opportunity to go out that door and to skite to someone, what would you skite about? What would you brag about? And here through the prophet Jeremiah, Yahweh says, and by the way, I just realized that some of you may not know why I use that word Yahweh. Each of you have a first name. God declared to Moses in the book of his, uh, Exodus that his first name is Yahweh. And that was spectacular. In fact, it's mentioned over a thousand times in the Old Testament. God so desires you to have a personal, intimate relationship with him, he's given us his first primary, instinctive, intuitive name, Yahweh. But in our, most of our English translations, it's, you know, it's appropriate. It's translated into an English word called the Lord. And so here we have God says, if you've got anything to boast about, make sure you're boasting about that you know me, that I am the Lord Yahweh who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, says the Lord. Realize that when you know him, he delights in that. Now, would you like to bring God pleasure today, beloved? Really? Would you like to bring God pleasure today? Yeah. That's a fair question, don't you think? That's a fair question for us to ask our friends and our family. And here in Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 24, God has put it in plain English language how you and I can bring the most intimate pleasure to God. Know him. Well, isn't that amazingly simple? Know him. So the question then is, how do I know him? And we'll explore that as we go. I suspect you know it already. So in Hosea chapter 6, verse 6 that we just read, the Lord said, I desire steadfast love, not sacrifice. The knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. Now, Israel, as you know, was a nation that was required to make animal sacrifices, grain offerings, water offerings, all sorts of offerings and sacrifices. And yet God here through the prophet Hosea says, but I have a preference that goes above and beyond that. My first heart's affectionate desire for you, my preference above all preferences is that you would be steadfast in your love for me and that you would actually know me as your God, I prefer that even more than sacrifices. Wow. God wants you to know him more than he wants your bank account, which is easy if you've got a bank account like mine. Because no, <laughs> there's not much to know. He wants you to know him more than he wants your good health and your popularity and your pleasure. He wants you to know him. And I... I, I fear that this broken man has not got the capacity to impress upon you the weightiness of what God is trying to impress upon us. God wants to be known by you. So much so, he has gone to an incomparable extent to do everything within his infinite power to captivate your attention, to grab your heart's affections and say, I want your affection. I want you to know me. I want want you to experience me. You get what Hosea is talking about? So seeking to understand the nature of God is one thing, but truly embracing the fact that Yahweh wants you to know him to your fullest capacity is a whole different matter. And those of us that have been in church life for many years, this is the touchstone that creates a bit of rub. Because often there are events in our lives that damage us. I like the broken biscuits. I wasn't one of the, the nice bickies. I'm one of the broken ones, sorry, Stuart. In fact, I was one of the crumbs. You know, life damages. Have you noticed that? 
I don't, I don't think there's any Christian that's not broken to some degree. And we often talk about this in Focus Bible Church. We all come together on Sunday morning to worship as broken people healed in Jesus Christ. But our bodies, our hearts, affections, our minds, our thinking, our health are often broken in various degrees. And so he wants us to know him even in our brokenness. Now, there are five standalone and unique characteristics of God that I want to just quickly run through and to help get your attention. Um, things I'm confident you already know, but in order for you to just really feel the weightiness of God's desire for your life this morning, I want to just remind you of some basic foundational doctrines which I'm confident you know. And the first one is one that doesn't get talked about very often nowadays, and that is God is Trinity. He is a Trinity. Now, the word Trinity is not actually found in our English Bibles and Scripture, um, and yet God is repeatedly spoken of as being three in one. That is, the one God equally manifesting himself in three separate yet same-charactered persons. And Deuteronomy 6 verse 4 tells us that the Lord our God, the Lord is one. That's known in the Hebrew as the Shema. There is one God. There is no competition with him. He is it. No idols, no man-made thingamajigs can even be compared with the one and only true God. Yet, in Genesis 1.26, speaking about the creation of mankind, God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness. And when God speaks of himself in the plural, he's saying that he is not only one, but he is also more than one. In Jesus' commission of Matthew uh, 28, verse 19, the great commission to the church, he identifies God the Father, the Son, who is Jesus, and God the Holy Spirit, each being distinct and yet one in holiness, one in thought, one in will, and one in purpose. Now, following Jesus' baptism, Matthew chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, records the heavens were opened to him, and he, Jesus, saw the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God, that's God the Father, descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, that's Jesus, with whom I, God the Father, am well pleased. Here, God the Father spoke from heaven, affirming that Jesus was his Son, and God the Spirit affirmed the Father's testimony by descending like a dove on Jesus. Oh, I would have loved to have been on the banks of that river that day. Wow. Just to see that visual, dominating manifestation of God. What an experience that would have been. So scripture reveals that God exists in three persons, co-equal, co-eternal, unified, inseparable, and self-existent. The Apostle Paul closes 2 Corinthians 13 verse 14 with the doxology. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. All three persons of God work in agreement and all three are intrinsically gracious, loving, and desiring of fellowship. So before I move on to the next facet of God, remember the triune God wants to be known by you. Father, Son, and Spirit wants you to know him personally. It's not good enough that you sit here this morning and say, I'm happy that the person next to me knows, knows him. God says, that's not good enough. I want you to know me, Father, Son, and Spirit. The next facet I want to draw to you about this one triune God is that God, Yahweh, is sovereign. Not a word that fits well into our modern uh, society or way of thinking. It means he is omniscient, all-powerful, and possibly this, this is possibly the most controversial truth of God in the worldwide church today. Okay. Uh, I'm happy if you crucify me over that. I can live with that one. But I think I'm in a safe house. God is the owner of everything and everyone. 
Psalm 24 verse 1 reads, The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. Whew. The world. Do you live in the earth? God says you belong to him. But I don't want to belong to him. Too bad. God states it as a fact. Even if you do not have a personal faith relationship with him, you still belong to him. Why? Because he knitted you together in your mother's womb. And you had no say in that matter. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. So, everything in the world belongs to him. And all who live in it. That's us. Every living person in this world belongs to the one triune sovereign God. Deuteronomy chapter 10 verse 14 adds, To the Lord your God belong heaven and, and the heaven of heavens and the earth with all that is in it. Planet earth including the climate and its inhabitants are the Lord's and we can trust him to manage it all well. God's sovereignty towers above all human knowledge, strength and abilities. In Isaiah chapter 46 verses 9 to 10, God explains to Isaiah, I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things not yet done, saying my counsel shall stand and I will, and we've heard that somewhere before, haven't we? I will try and figure out how I will accomplish my purpose. doesn't say that. He says, my declaration is I will accomplish all my purpose. And on that he is non-negotiable. And we should praise him for that because if we entered into negotiating with, negotiation with God, we would mess it up every time. So God is indomitable, self-governing, and without influence from outside sources. Daniel proclaimed that God most high rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will. Daniel 4 verse 17. And despite what mankind thinks, no ruler of any nation is there by their own choice alone. First Chronicles 16.31 and Revelation 1 verse 5 tells us that. God appoints the kings of the nations. They think they're very clever having elections and it's right for us to participate in elections. But at the end of the day, the person who gets elected is there by divine appointment, whether they believe in God or not, whether we like God's choice or not. They are there by divine appointment. God's sovereignty means that what he desires, that he does. Job 23.13 tells us that. And in the believer's life, it is God who works in you, if you're a Christian, it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Philippians 2 verse 13. Now, what's the big contention about sovereignty? It's not that some Christians don't like to think that God's way out there and he can sort of mysteriously, mystically sort of governs things. No. Here's the offense, the rub. Some People, even some who call themselves Christians, will not bend the knee and say, God, I'm content that you work through my will. Because I want to reserve my will for myself. I want to be the boss of my decisions. And God says, you can think that all you want. But here's the fact of the matter, my child. Even in your distorted, misinformed view of how your will does or does not work, I will work in and through your will to accomplish my purposes in your life with or without your permission or agreement or alignment. Now that's a big pill to swallow. But that's what God reveals to us. Therefore, we are under obligation to accept. Now, you're thinking maybe, as I have had to reason through this, but what about all the misery in my life? What about the terrible things I've done in my life? What about the sins I've done? What did we read in Hosea? God even brings those terrible failures in our lives 
into our lives so that he can heal us, so that he can restore us. He even brings the things that we hate the most into our lives, not accidentally, but as an expression of his love to give you the opportunity to bow the knee and say, God, I don't like this, but I want to give my pain back to you. I want to be set free from my own self-inflicted misery and sin so that you can be honoured in my life, so that you can be seen by others to be indeed the true sovereign Lord and saviour of this broken man's mechanical life. I speak as a broken motor mechanic. Joe reminded me of a photo. Not long after I got hit on the head with a steel pipe in our garage, my youngest son Nathan gave me a hard hat as a birthday gift. <laughs> and some, someone took a photo of me mopping out our automotive workshop with me wearing my hard hat. Why? Because a loving, sovereign God wanted to use me in ways that I never imagined possible, but ways that could only be accomplished if he hit me on the head with a steel pipe and inflicted severe, long-standing health problems. And really, do I have the right to shake my fist at him and say, that's not good enough, God? Really, do I have that right? No, I don't. Why? Because God inflicted pain so that I could be healed in Christ and released from the limitations of my own expectations of this life to serve him. Now, I don't think my suffering in life is unique. And I suspect if we were to be honest, each of us would have some form of terrible suffering that we could share. And that's not the point of my message. The point is that this one triune Loving God who wants to be known wants you to understand that even the most ugly things inflicted in your life, the betrayal of others, the treachery committed upon you by others, has been not accidental but a part of his purpose to bring you to an uncompromising point of surrender to his lordship to say, God, I'm happy that you used my pain for your glory. Just do it and don't wait for me because I'll blunder. I'll drag my feet. You accomplish it so that you can be praised. You can be honored. You use whatever methods you want, but please, God, do it and do not wait for me. What a loving God. You and I would never think of a goodness like that. That's a good God, by the way. That's a very good God. A God who is so good, he's willing to use even pain for his glory and for the spread of the gospel of Jesus Christ and for your ultimate blessing. The third thing I want to share about God is um, that God is all-knowing. He's omniscient. Nothing is unknown by God. All the subjects not yet entered into the mind of mankind already is known by God fully. Think of that. You see, mankind thinks we're very clever because some clever chap created this thing called AI. Whatever that is. You know, really? Whatever AI may or may not be capable of is already fully known by God. It's already been understood by God. So, you know, God knows it all already. There is not a single thing in the in entirety of tangible and spiritual realms which he does not have a full and thorough knowledge of. Nothing escapes his attention and nothing catches him by surprise, including your thoughts, your pains, your inner heart thinking. And even as I share this and as you sit and listen, and I suspect you, each of you will have different thoughts flowing through your minds as I'm saying this, God knows those thoughts. God cares about those thoughts. God is actually interested in those thoughts that you not, may never even share with me. And if they're bad thoughts, please don't share them with me. But you get the point. God knows them already, and he cares for them. And he wants those thoughts to be used for his glory and your eternal blessing. So Elihu, one of um, Job's less than wonderful friends, said, God is mighty in strength of understanding and perfect in knowledge. That's Job 36 verse 5 and verse 16. 
you know, when thinking of a person's heart or their thoughts, the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. 1 Samuel 16, 9, verse 7. God is not limited by flesh and blood, but accurately perceives the innermost thoughts of a person. That's a scary thing. I actually find that scary. If it doesn't scare you, it should scare you. You may better fool one another. You may better fool me, and that's not hard to do. You may be able to fool yourself to some degree. But God knows. God knows what's in there. He knows your capacities for good and evil. He knows how you are going to try and maybe reject him and put things off. He understands all that. But he also knows what you're capable of if you surrender your life to the control of Jesus Christ. He also knows what you are capable of for bringing him glory if only you would surrender the control of your life over to him. That's a wonderful big thought to have. God's not limited as we are limited. The psalmist confessed, Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came into being. That's Psalm 139 again, verse 16. So while we are merrily living our lives, making decisions this way, decisions that way, making plans, and all those things are good and right, God says, just understand that I, knew, I know it already. You're not going to surprise me if anything. There's no jack-in-the-box that's suddenly going to pop out and God says, gee, I didn't see that coming. wonder why they did that. That just doesn't happen. God knows it. He understands it. Even the things that he does not like about you, he understands and he wants to use those things to bring you to a close, intimate relationship with him. So in Isaiah 40 verse 14, Isaiah asks a rhetorical question, some rhetorical questions of God. Whom did he consult? Whom did God consult? And who made God understand? Who taught him the path of justice and taught him knowledge and showed him the way of understanding? They're rhetorical because the answer is no one. No one can add to God's knowledge. God cannot be corrected because he's never lacking anything in his knowledge and he's never in error. John sums it up perfectly. God, he knows everything, he says in 1 John 3 verse 20. God knows everything. What a marvelous truth. God knows us best and he loves us most. Wow. I'm glad God knows everything because I sure don't. I don't even know enough to get out of the messes I create for myself. But God knows, and he's able, he's willing, but he's also wanting. Next, God is all present. He's omnipresent, we call that in theology. All created beings exist in one place at one time. I'm sure you've noticed that about yourself. No matter how fast one moves, either human or angelic, they remain fixed in one location, but not so with God. As John 4 verse 24 tells us, God is spirit, therefore he does not suffer the spatial limitations or restraints that we do. It was this understanding which enabled the psalmist to say, where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in Sheol, that's death, you're there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. That's Psalm 139 again, verses 7 to 10. There is no escaping the presence and attention of the Almighty God, for which we should be very thankful. Have you ever noticed in yourself, there are times in life when you just want to go away and hide. And I'm not saying that's wrong. That, that can be a very healthy therapeutic thing to do at times. But realize that when you're in hiding, you're not alone. He is with you. You can hide in the darkest places possible, both physically and emotionally. But in your private darkness, God is present with you. 
whether you acknowledge that or not, whether you understand that or not, or whether you accept that or not, God's testimony is, I am present with you in those places of isolation. And so God is equally present in life and death and time and history and eternity and timelessness. In every location of all realms, he is there. At the completion of creation, we read that God saw everything that he had made and behold, it was very good as we had brought to us yesterday from Genesis 1 verse 33, 31. Sorry. He alone could see every facet of the entirety of creation in a snapshot of time and presence because he was everywhere to observe it all and he says, in my presence everywhere, I'm telling you everything is perfectly good. It's very good. Yet, in spite of all this, God invites all of mankind to know him. All scripture repeats that God is not only knowable, but he wants to be known. He's not an isolationist who, who's content to be hidden away and unknown. God has painted identification notices across the entire universe for all to see and respond to. I love looking at the uh, photos of the Hubble telescope, you know, that looks way... And, and you know the satellites have got going around Mars, wheelie turly around Mars? Aren't the photos spectacular? Did you see God? You should have because it's just stamped across everything. I created Mars. I created the colours. I created the dust. I created it all. And let's face it, Mars is just a little dot in the eternity that God has created. Paul explains in Romans chapter 1, verse 19 to 20, which I'm sure you're familiar with, about the ungodly, that what can be known about God is plain to them. That's to the even the atheists that claim there is no God. It's plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. Here's the fact of the matter. The universe is God's ID card. <laughs> you can't argue with it. You can't make it go away. You may wish you could rationalize it away, but God has got his name stamped across it all, telling his creature, his creation, crying out, look at me and learn about your creator. Yet even creation pales by comparison with the revelation of God's son, Jesus Christ. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 2 to 3 explains it with remarkable clarity. God has spoken to us by his son whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He, that is Jesus, is the radiance of the glory of God, and note this, the exact imprint of God the Father's nature. He, Jesus, upholds the universe by the word of his power. Jesus is worth knowing, by the way. You want to know God? There's only one way. Know his son. Why? Not because Jesus is sort of like God, but because Jesus is the perfect, full imprint of divine nature in a human man, and his name was Jesus Christ, and he came from a place called Nazareth. God wants to be known, not as a figment of our imaginations, but as the God who has revealed himself with clarity, with power, and in person through his son, Jesus Christ. John 1 verse 18, and I'll read it to you from the NIV because it just has a clearer nuance. No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son, that's Jesus, who is himself God, is and is in closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. Now, the world is without excuse. You know, I would love if I could get paid every time some non-Christian says, oh, Lincoln, I could only believe if he would show himself to me. Well, hello. He did, and what did we do to him? We murdered the poor bloke. We crucified him to a cross. And what did he do wrong? Nothing. 
He just simply came and revealed that he is almighty God incarnate in human flesh. And so we hated that fact so much, we hung him on a cross to get rid of him. So the question is answered already. He has come and revealed himself to us in person, face to face. And I would suggest that if Jesus Christ was to turn up on planet Earth today, we would do the same to him again. In fact, it's quite likely that he would actually get aborted before birth because the world hates deity that much. Solomon prayed that God would bring Gentile foreigners to Israel for prayer and that God would answer them in order that all the peoples of the earth may know your name and fear you. 1 Kings 8.43 You know why God answers prayer? So that we would know he is God. God even answers the prayers of non-Christians because he wants them to know that he is God. God wants your neighbours to know that you pray for them so that when those prayers get answered, you can draw it to your neighbour's attention. Why? So that your neighbour would know there is a God. He is knowable. He listens. He wants your attention and he wants you to know him. Could God make it any clearer? I don't think so. Moses, sorry, go back, I've got a real goody one for you. Through all of the Lord's interactions of Israel, including his discipline of them, it was so that they shall know that I am the Lord, Ezekiel 5 verse 13 says. In fact, the Lord repeats this approximately 70 times in the book of Ezekiel, that you may know that I am the Lord. Now, if I wrote you a letter and I repeated the same thing 70 times, do you think you would get the idea? Of course you would. But Israel missed the whole point. Why? Because it turned out they did not actually want to be known by God and they did not want to know their holy God. And so the same truth remains today. God wants to be known. He repeats it over and over through creation and through his written word and through the revelation of his son, Jesus Christ, to the world and through us, his born-again children of faith. God wants to be known. Moses was minding his own business, you may recall, uh, caring for his father-in-law's sheep on the west side of Mount Horeb when God stepped uninvited into his life. You remember that? Moses didn't ask for God. Moses did not go looking for God. Moses had no desire, actually, to be confronted by God. That's a very familiar sound to it, don't you think? And yet the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. You can read that in Exodus chapter 3, verses 2 to 4. God initiated what would become a spectacular friendship with disinterested Moses, which changed the future for Israel and in fact for us. Much of our Old Testament was written by Moses. God gave his law to the world through Moses. And yet Moses did not want God. Isn't that interesting? But God, you know, that would be my testimony. God stepped into my life uninvited. And I suspect it's probably true in your life. Long before you came and repented and called out to Jesus to save you, God was already working in your life and he never asked your permission. There was no email popping up saying, hey, can I step into your life next week? No. God never sent you a letter in the post saying, uh, by the way, can I have your permission to take over your life? He didn't, did he? But did he? Yes, he took over our lives. Why? Because he loved us so much that he stepped in. We may think we're putting up a good fight, resisting. Give up while you can. Just let him be God. Let him love you with the perfect love that he has for you. You'll never regret it. It's such a wonderful thing, you know. And so, 
The Lord wanted to be known by Moses, so the Lord made it happen. And Jesus prayed, This is eternal life, that they may know you, the Father, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. That's in John 17, verse 3. God the Father wants to be known, and Jesus wants to make the Father known to us as the Father wants his Son to be known. Let Jesus Christ take over. Let him have control. Let him invade your life so that you can know the eternal, almighty God. Jesus is the incarnation of God. Colossians chapter 2, verse 9 says, For in him, in Jesus, the whole fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. And although the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him, he came to his own, that is to his own creation, and his own created people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. That's John chapter 1 verse 10. Isn't that wonderful? To all who do believe, he gives the right to be the children of God, the sons of God. What a privilege. Belief in Jesus Christ does not begin a casual awareness type of friendship with God. No, faith in Christ is the beginning of an eternal and intimate relationship that sees us adopted as God's children to our Heavenly Father. God does everything needed to be personally known by mankind. To know God is to experience God. Think of New Testament Saul. Now here was a man who used all of his energies, his brilliant intellect, his fantastic education, and his religious influence to fight Jesus Christ and to destroy the church. No one did a better job of it than Saul. Saul hated Jesus. Remember, Saul was only just a, a, a few years younger than Jesus. So Saul grew up in the society that Jesus was moving in. Saul, if he did not see, he would have heard of the miracles Jesus was doing, etc., etc. And yet Saul hated him so much that he wanted to eradicate everyone that loved Jesus. And he thought he was doing a good job. He was sticking Christians in prison. He was having Christians executed. He was bumping them off. And he thought, man, I'm on to a good thing here. I'm going to get rid of these guys, you know. Until one day, there was an uninvited visitor into his life. A visitor that never asked permission, that never came knocking at the door and says, can I visit? No. On the road to Damascus, with the intention and the legal documentation to murder Christians in Damascus and to take the living ones captive back to Jerusalem for imprisonment, Jesus Christ appeared to him in such a br bright light that Saul was blinded. And he cried out. He knew. He said, Who are you, Lord? And Jesus spoke to him. He said, I'm Jesus who you are persecuting. Wow. What a confrontation. And so we see that Saul was, had his life seriously stepped into by God's Son, Jesus Christ. And you can read about that in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 8 and chapter 9. So Jesus Christ steps into Saul's life without invitation. The change in Saul's life that followed was dramatic and could not be argued against because it was so obvious. And scripture records that for some days Saul was with the disciples at Damascus and immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogues saying he is the son of God, Acts chapter 9, verse 19 and 20. So here's this man following three days of blindness. He puts faith in Christ, not voluntarily by the way. And... His first thing he did after having food, because the Bible records that he did not eat or drink anything for three days or nights, the first thing he did after he got a bit of tucker into him, he went straight into the house of most opposition, the Jewish synagogue, the place that he was welcome, 
the place that he would normally go to declare and call Jews to hate Christians. He went into that place and says, this Jesus is the Son of God. No wonder they hated him. And so those people who three days earlier were his allies instantly became his enemies. And Jesus never asked his permission. You know, what a wonderful blessing I'm sure Paul realized that was. Saul now knew Jesus Christ. And from that time on, Saul would be known as by a new name, Paul. And you see, when you are truly known by Jesus, you also truly know Jesus and he changes you. The result is that you can't keep Jesus' friendship to yourself just as Saul couldn't either. There's no such thing, beloved, as a secret Christian. Get, get that myth out of your mind. It's a myth. I love reading stories of Christians in persecuted countries. And yes, they sometimes go hiding to save their lives, but they never, ever stay silent. That's how the gospel grows and spreads. They share the good news of Jesus Christ. Even while they're running for their lives and hiding in the caves, etc., etc., they share and the church grows because more and more people put faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. The promise God makes to Israel, he also makes to us. And I'm going to close with this in Jeremiah 29, verses 13 to 14. You will seek me and find me. When you seek me with all your heart, I will be found by you, declares Yahweh. My friends, this morning, do you want to be found by Yahweh? Are you willing to open up your hearts and give it all to him, good, bad, and different pain and joy, and say, God, I want to know you, and I want my life to be evidence that you know me and I know you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the just the spectacular truths that we've been considering this morning, that you are incomparably knowable. And we give you praise that you have stepped into our lives that you have gone to extraordinary lengths to make yourself known to us. And some of us, Lord, kicked and ran and hid, and some of us have put up a fight. And maybe this morning, Lord, someone here is putting up a fight to resist you. But you cry out, you shout, I want to be known. I've given my son so that you could know me through my son, Jesus Christ. O oh Lord, be glorified in each and every one of our lives this morning through having your will accomplished in our lives. We surrender our heart's affections to you. We yield our thinking to you. We bow our memories to you with all the good and painful memories. We give them to you and say, take all that we are, all that makes me me, take that and be known by you so that you could be the invader of my life for your glory, for the testimony of your good name and for your praise. And so others could come to know you through me, through us, we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.